Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Navarro Betancourt, and I am the scientific director of Quadroscope, a venture capital fund that invests in early stage biotechnology companies that aim to extend health span by targeting the mechanisms of aging. And um, I had the opportunity to talk with Louis Hawthorne, who is a very interesting person and has over 25 years of experience leading multidisciplinary teams in life sciences. Currently, Lou is the founder and the CEO of Nanotics, one of Quadroscope's portfolio companies. Lou actually invented the core technology of Nanotics called the Nanots. And these Nanots are injectable nanoparticles designed to absorb and capture circulating soluble proteins that contribute to aging and to other diseases. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Louis Hawthorne. So let's, um, let's begin with the hardest question, the, the why. Um, why did you begin working on what later became uh, nanotics? Well, I didn't start out uh, to develop nanots. Um, mostly I was starting out helping different groups manage scientific projects. Mm -hmm. I don't have a formal scientific educational background and I wanted to be helpful and I wanted to you know, support myself, my family. So after Dolly the Sheep was cloned, um, I was given an opportunity to manage a dog cloning effort, which it turns out that dogs are actually the hardest of all species to clone, harder than humans even. Mm -hmm. And what initially was going to be just a, a few months of pulling a team together ended up being 12 years of managing multiple cloning projects, multiple species. And cloning is really relevant to disease and to aging because uh, cloning is very much um, an artificial, previously thought to be impossible process. And you really have to get deep into cell signaling, how cells mm -hmm. talk to each other, if you're going to be successful in cloning. And one of the key aspects of cloning is you're putting a foreign embryo into a surrogate and you're trying to create privilege, Im immunologic privilege, meaning the immune system of the host tolerates this foreign embryo. And that process is actually the opposite of what you're trying to do when you treat cancer, which is you're trying to strip away the immune privilege that the tumor erects to defend itself. And senescent cells do this too. They, mm -hmm. They're abnormal and they have to defend themselves with immune privilege. So studying cloning and immune privilege and doing years of deep dives into how the immune system works, why does the immune system um, fail sometimes? Why does it sometimes allow diseases? Why would a perfect immune system ever tolerate any disease? And and then how do drugs work? Why don't drugs work better? How do cancer immunotherapies work? So I just have this relentless curiosity, which ultimately led me to see different pieces of a puzzle mm -hmm. that are put together traditionally a certain way. And I began to realize they could be put together a different way. And I think when it all really started to come together um, was when I lost one of my mentors uh, to cancer. And this was a brilliant man, PhD in endocrinology, which is the science of cell signaling. Mm -hmm. And um, he died of uh, stage four esophageal cancer within just three months of his diagnosis. And in trying to save him, I had an investor who just loved this man. We all loved him. And uh, he gave me basically a blank check to find something that could save him. And we weren't, we weren't fast enough. His cancer just was uh, like a, a firestorm. But I did find some stuff that was cutting edge, not yet state standard of care, including a phoresis technology in Germany. Now, phoresis is the extracorporeal outside the body filtration of blood. And it's done a lot in Japan and in Germany. It's not done much in the U.S., but um, it's very powerful technology for removing impurities from blood. And there's a group in Germany that was using this technology to treat cancer by taking out of blood tumor generated immune inhibitors. Now these are, these are soluble immune inhibitors, meaning dissolved in blood. Mm -hmm. So they're treating cancer, not by targeting cells, but by targeting something in the blood and not additively, they're not adding a drug, they're taking something out. And I saw the most amazing regressions 
happening in this little clinic in Germany, just phenomenal stuff. And that made me realize it's incredibly powerful just depleting things from blood. It's an alternative to drugs rooted in the same science. It's just a different way and potentially a better way of treating disease. So what is an anotics approach to, to, uh, to deplete these uh, uh, pathogenic substances from, uh, from blood? How, how, what yeah. is your different take on that problem? Good question. Good question. So um, the, big, the big problem with phoresis, which is very, mm -hmm. very powerful, is that it's invasive. And the particular phoresis that they're doing in this German clinic involves um, putting a catheter into the subclavian artery pretty much right down into the aorta of the patient to get the flow rate they need to deplete these tumor generated immune inhibitors and induce these profound regressions. Um, as I mentioned, I had um, pretty much a blank check from our investor, not just to save our friend, we, were, we weren't fast enough to do that, but to do something in his memory. And, and that included studying this technology in Germany and some other technologies. Um, to try to bring something new to the world. Mm -hmm. In the course of studying that phoresis technology in Germany, um, we learned that the mass of tumor generated immune inhibitors that they're depleting in a three to four hour treatment, um, which can make the difference between tumor progression and tumor regression, was just 10 millionths of a gram. Okay. So that raised the question of why do you need a big refrigerator sized device and why do you need to be connected to it for several hours, several times a week? If you're just depleting a few millions of a gram of target, there's got to be a better way of doing that. So that started a few years of noodling on, and I had done some um, microtech ordering on nanotech in the cloning work where we built microfluidic embryo culture devices, microfluidic ova maturation devices. So I had some small scale engineering experience and I began to think maybe there's a way to inject a nanoscale structure that would capture these targets. Okay. The big challenge of course, and this is true in um, aging as well. The big challenge of course, is some of these targets are undruggable because for instance, um, one of the big targets is the soluble receptor of tumor necrosis factor. So tumor necrosis factor is the body's main cytotoxic molecule. The immune system uses it to destroy aberrant cells. And there's a receptor for it on pretty much every cell in the body. It's like the master self-destruct switch that every cell has so the immune system can destroy it. If you, under certain circumstances, it can be cleaved off uh, into... Uh, a cloud of immune inhibitors. It's the receptor for the cytotox body's main cytotoxic molecule. So it's, it's a powerful inhibitor of immune response. And cancer cells all surround themselves with these soluble TNF receptors. You can't drug it though, because if you put in a drug against soluble TNF receptors, you'll also block membrane TNF receptors. And that's a pathway that must be left open for normal immunity to work. You know, the immune system has to have a way of destroying aberrant cells. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a challenge that we were able to solve with a nanoscale structure. And the idea is how can we capture these soluble TNF receptors, but not drug, not drug them, which would interfere with membrane TNF receptors. And the solution was an absorptive particle. So it's basically molecular apheresis. It, it works like apheresis, but it works at a, at, at a molecular scale with no machine. So you inject it into the body. Within a few heartbeats, these nanoparticles are mixed uh, evenly throughout blood. Mm -hmm. And um, we're only putting in very low mass of them, but we're putting in trillions of them. So if you think about that, the distribution in blood, within a few seconds, a typical nanot and a typical target are within a micron of each other. And Brownian motion or diffusion brings them together within seconds. Literally the first impact is within a second or two. Um, but the nanots are shielded against all cell surface interaction. So we have capture agents for whatever target we're interested in depleting like soluble TNF receptors is the example I gave you. Mm -hmm. But the nanots have a shield, which is basically just a physical shield that prevents that capture agent from, from touching a cell. 
if it touched a cell, it would block, if it touched a cell like a drug, it would block a vital immune pathway, but it can't touch any cell at all. It has a porous shield that allows it to soak up the soluble targets it's programmed to capture, but mm -hmm. prevents any interaction with membrane forms of the same target. That's a, that's a trick that drugs can't do, distinguishing biochemically identical soluble targets from their membrane form. Drugs can't do that in general. Yeah, that, that's that's amazing. So so maybe we can think of nanodes as uh, as micro sponges. Exactly, uh, or nano sponges. Nano that's sponges, the closest sorry. analogy. They're they're basically the world's smallest uh, biocompatible, programmable sponges. And um, and what happens to these sponges when, when once they uh, absorb uh, whatever they were targeted to, the, to to absorb? Yeah. So um, any particle in blood is going to get um, absorbed by macrophage, macrophages, engulfed mm -hmm. by macrophages in a process called phagocytosis. Um, these uh, are primarily called Kupfer cells. They're, mac they're liver resident macrophages. And they just absorb any particle that doesn't seem to be natural. Actually, they absorb a lot of natural things too. They absorb dead cells, et cetera. They're kind of like the... They're, they're immune cells. Macrophages are immune cells. They have an immune function, but they're also garbage collectors. Mm -hmm. So um, they get, nanots get captured by these things within 16 hours, which is mm -hmm. plenty of time. I mean, the average phoresis is three to four hours. So we just want to be longer than phoresis. Okay. And then they get captured by these macrophages and broken down into small molecules along with their cargo, you know, their captured targets, which are then excreted. So, so then the body is able to degrade these uh, nanoparticles naturally, and that yeah, they're biodegradable. The um, that's, uh, they're that's biodegradable. Really awesome. the, the core is the core is silica, which is in everything you eat, everything grown in soil is loaded in silica. That, that's that's fantastic. So um, let's uh, take a, a step back and um, a look at the bigger picture. Um, in general, uh, so-called um, longevity or Heroscience companies have the potential to treat aging as a condition of, of cellular and molecular damage, but also to treat age-related diseases in the conventional biotechnology markets, uh, such as cancer or cardiovascular disease. So these age-related diseases become the focus of, of clinical trials to, to eventually receive approval of the FDA. Um, can you please elaborate on, on how nanotics is planning to tackle aging and uh, what age-related diseases are uh, are they focusing on? You, you mentioned cancer early in the interview. Right. So it's a huge advantage to be treating age-related diseases as mm -hmm. you go after aging because mm -hmm. the FDA doesn't recognize aging as a disease. Maybe they should, but the mm -hmm. fact is they don't. They probably won't. Um, but we believe, and a lot of people believe, that there are fundamental core mechanisms in common between aging and age-related disease. Mm -hmm. um, and there are really two categories for this. Now, now a lot of perfectly good um, anti-aging therapies have intracellular mechanisms. So they're targeting something going on inside the cell. Nanots don't do that. Nanots manipulate uh, intercellular signaling, the signaling between cells. Now, we believe that good cells do bad things when they get bad information, just kind of like good kids do bad things in a bad neighborhood when other kids give them bad information. So um, our goal is to deplete the information that drives age-related disease, that drives or enables age-related disease, and okay. in you know we believe aging as well. So we're developing a toolkit of eight nanots, and these have utility both for age-related disease and they all have utility in aging as well, we believe. Four of the nanots target soluble inflammatory targets, and four of them deplete soluble inhibitory targets. And collectively, they drive dozens of diseases. And, and the grid looks like this. So mm -hmm. on the left are inflammatory targets, um, and you can see everywhere there's a folder icon. We've built a big library of third-party peer-reviewed publications that document the relationship between that inflammatory target and that disease. And on the right, we 
call this category inhibitory disease with inhibitory targets. An inhibitory disease is any disease where you have aberrant cells that are abnormal in all the ways the immune system evolved to detect and, de and destroy, but it leaves them alone. And in every case, it leaves them alone because they secrete immune inhibitors, which is a trick they learned from the placenta, which has to do that to survive. It's not, it's only half the mother, it's also half the father, needs these inhibitors to survive. So all cancers work this way. Um, we actually have a different ontology of oncology, which is how does your cancer defend itself? What, what soluble immune inhibitors is your cancer secreting? And if your cancer is secreting soluble PDL1 primarily, then that's a candidate for treatment with our nano. We don't care where in the body it is. Oh. The whole, all the body is fluidically connected. So we're recategorizing cancer by it, the inhibitors that it uses to defend itself. We hope the FDA will agree with that. Uh, there's some precedent for that. We hope they will agree that we can treat any patient who has elevated levels of soluble PDL1. If not, then we'll, we'll have to treat melanoma. Mel melanoma actually is the cancer that has the highest levels of soluble PDL1. Um, but, but whatever, if, if the FDA makes us choose a specific cancer type like melanoma, we will then add on to that a patient inclusion criterion that they must have elevated levels of soluble PDL1 or, or soluble TNF receptors, whichever one we're treating in that study. And then as long as they, the patient have these elevated levels, we believe that nanos will be effective. Mm -hmm. so, so to tie this into aging, there's a branch of gerontology called inflammaging, which posits mm -hmm. that uh, these inflammatory cytokines rise with age and damage every tissue they touch. Now that's, that's not a hypothesis, that's a fact. They rise with age. In, young, in healthy young people, these molecules should only be delivered, are only delivered in a focal way, meaning an immune cell, an intelligent immune cell, migrates to an aberrant cell cluster and deploys these in, cytotoxic molecules in very close proximity to the aberrant cell. That's the way it should work and does work when you're young. But as we age, these cytotoxic molecules get delivered non-focally. They begin to be secreted systemically, which should never happen. And, um, and, that, and they, they destroy every tissue they touch. Every, that's what they're designed to do. That's what they, what they evolved to do. And the body has certain protective responses that are age-related. So for instance, when these molecules land in the heart, there's a mm -hmm. calcification response. That's what atherosclerosis is. It's a calcification of heart muscle in response to systemically elevated tumor necrosis factor. And likewise, one of the theories of Alzheimer's is that plaque formation is a protective response against uh, systemically elevated inflammatory cytokines. And you can go down the whole list of diseases and, and have a link. They all have a link to these inflammatory cytokines. And the idea is that you can't, your brain cannot, from, in terms of evolutionary biology, mm -hmm. your brain cannot die, your heart cannot die. So evolution has favored the emergence of suboptimal ways to keep this tissue alive okay. uh, in the presence of rising cytokines. And um, so, to, but to have a therapy that can deplete these cytokines and on a regular basis, as we plan to do with nanots, that's a potent anti-aging therapy, we believe. It's certainly a way of treating disease, including the most acute form of inflammatory disease, which is sepsis, which kills more people than all forms of cancer. And then on the inhibitory side, uh, the key here is senescence cells. So there's good consensus within the field of gerontology that um, senescent cells, not perfect consensus, but pretty good consensus, that senescent cells, these aberrant zombie cells that are sort of halfway to cancer when P53 shuts them down, uh, they're secreting a variety of crap, including these inflammatory molecules, uh, and they're inducing transformation into senescent cells of their neighboring cells. Um, and that they're, the, the big question is, why doesn't the immune system destroy them? Why doesn't the immune system destroy these uh, senescent cells? And the answer mm -hmm. is they, they secrete the same immune inhibitors 
that cancer uses, which is not a surprise because you know they're halfway to cancer when their um, tumor suppressor genes shut them down or put them into senescence. So our, our strategy for treating senescent cells is the same as our strategy for treating cancer, which is to deplete the soluble immune inhibitors that senescent cells use to defend themselves and then let the immune system um, give, give the immune system a clear line of sight to these senescent cells and allow immune mediated destruction to, to, to take over. So um, nanots can uh, deplete um, these proteins and restore them to, to their normal or, or their um, physiological levels. And uh, for example, a person uh, who is 60 year old can potentially receive this treatment and, and reduce the circulating proteins to the circulating toxic proteins to a level of, um, of a 30 year old. Absolutely, is, is or correct? lower, you know, or even lower. Yeah, we can we can deplete them below the level of detection in in a minute, you know, two minutes. Um, and yeah. and what's important here is that the nanot shielding. So there are actually drugs against all of these inflammatory mm -hmm. cytokines, but the drugs don't discri discriminate soluble from membrane forms, and they don't discriminate circulating forms from tissue resident forms. Uh, so they cause as much harm as they, you know, as they protect. Um, nanots are shielded, so we can take out these circulating elevated uh, inflammatory cytokines without disturbing the immune system's ability to deliver them focally when needed. That's key because the, the drugs against inflammatory cytokines all reduce immune competence. Mm -hmm. That's a side effect that's written on their labels. Yeah, and what's the population least able to withstand a reduction of their immune competence? It's the elderly. And it, it, it's a serious side effect, as, 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 as you mentioned. So, um, so Lou, I, I understand that uh, Nanotics has um, research collaborations with, um, with three of the best hospitals in the, in the US. Um, are you able to, to elaborate on this? Can, can you share some sure. preliminary data? So we have, um, we have collaborations that we've announced with Mayo Clinic, which is, has been in process all year, uh, all of 2022. Um, we have a collaboration that we've announced that is just kicking off with Mass mm -hmm. General in Boston, okay. which is under the PI there is Keith Flaherty, who co-founded Loxo Oncology, which is probably, it's one of the biggest cancer company exits ever. It was like $8 billion. Oh. He's a brilliant immuno-oncologist. And um, he's going to be overseeing testing of nanos against soluble TNF receptors, which I've mentioned. Um, but the big news is, is out of Mayo Clinic. Um, we we have a collaboration with them to um, develop and test nanos against soluble PDL1. Okay. So PDL1 is an interesting target. Uh, PD, PDL1 is an inhibitory protein on the surface of cancer cells. It has a a binding partner, a cognate on the surface of immune cells. And when they come in contact with each other, when PDL1 binds PD1, it puts the immune cell into energy, sort of suspended animation, puts it to sleep, I guess, can also kill it. Um, what people now, now there are drugs against both the PDL1 protein on cancer cells and, and the PD1 receptor on immune cells. There's seven approved drugs, and it's the largest drug class in oncology like $25 billion in annual sales. They're all toxic to various degrees and they don't, they don't work all that well. They work in 10 to 20% of cancer patients and they also stop working after a certain period of time. There's a soluble form of, of PDL1, the inhibitory protein, and it correlates very negatively with survival. Uh, it's predictive of non-responders to the drugs. It rises with the stage of cancer. Uh, it's, it's a legitimate target by itself. And mm -hmm. there um, are some really good advantages in targeting it specifically rather than using a drug against all forms of PDL1. Um, I'll just mention one of the reasons why the big, a big question that people ask is why don't drugs against PDL1 work better than they do? And this is actually a question that's bigger than just drugs against PDL1. All drugs that target the tumor microenvironment 
mm-hmm. have a major challenge that they face, which is the aberrant vasculature of the tumor microenvironment leads to elevated fluidic pressure within the uh, microenvironment. The pressure is higher inside the microenvironment, and getting anything into that microenvironment is a very difficult challenge. You need very high doses of a drug, and you're still only going to penetrate partway into the microenvironment. It's called IFP, interstitial fluidic pressure. Okay. That's not a problem for nanox because we're not trying to put anything into the tumor microenvironment or any other aberrant tissue compartment. We're pulling things out. And so we work with the elevated fluidic pressure in the microenvironment. And the way it works is nanots create what's called a diffusion sink. And a diffusion sink just means you denude circulation of a target. You create like a vacuum of the target. And everything in the body is fluidically connected and wants to equalize. So it, that equalization process induces my, migration of target out of any compartment where it's elevated, like the tissue, like the tumor microenvironment. And it's very fast. Uh, That migration starts happening within seconds. And over an hour or two, you can denude the microenvironment of target, at which point the immune system suddenly is potent within the tumor microenvironment without any drugs and can target and destroy the cancer. So... um... Lou, talking about the combination of uh, of drugs for for cancer treatment, and specifically uh, drugs that uh, modulate the immune system, Moderna and Merck recently released uh, preliminary results of a successful clinical trial in patients who had surgery to resect melanoma. And in this trial, patients who received Keytruda and a personalized uh, mRNA cancer vaccine developed by Moderna had a longer cancer-free survival than patients who only received Keytruda. So where do nanots fit in these results? Um, Are you planning to use them uh, as an adjuvant after surgery or in combination with other uh, immunomodulatory strategies like like vaccines or perhaps as, as monotherapy? So first... We, want, we really want to see how nanots work as a monotherapy. And uh, so okay. far, they work great. Okay. Doing monotherapy at Mayo Clinic of nanots against soluble PDL1, nanots by themselves significantly outperform checkpoint inhibitors. So naturally, we want to explore that in humans as well. But in the, in the real world, drugs get combined. So we fully expect and are very comfortable with nanots being com- combined with stan- standard of care. In the specific Merck study, uh, there are really two things going on. One, they're using um, the Moderna platform to train the patient immune system against neoantigens from the patient's own tumor. And they're really doing that to enhance the patient's immune capabilities relative to the identification, the targeting of the tumor, and the destruction of the tumor. We actually believe that once you take out immune inhibitors, the ability of the immune system to target and destroy uh, the patient's tumor is going to be enhanced without the need to do a complex, logistically challenging and expensive autologous treatment, such as what what Merck did. We think what Merck did is great because it's it's helping patients. That's the most important thing. But we think it can be done better by focusing on disinhibiting the tumor microenvironment first. Now, relative to the adjunctive use of Keytruda, I actually think that nanots against soluble PDL1 are going to pair very well with Keytruda. And I'm not sure it's necessary, but I think they would pair very well. And the reason is uh, Keytruda is an antibody that blocks the PD1 receptor. Nanots targeting soluble PDL1 take out the main protein that ligates and activates the PD-1 receptor, which is soluble PDL1. So you could, if you need additional efficacy, you could block, you could use Keytruda or pembrolizumab to block the PD-1 receptor. But the thing you want to try first, that, that actually dysregulates the patient immune system. It has benefit in cancer, but it has a whole host of other side effects. So the first thing you want to do is just take out the molecule that doesn't belong there in the first place which is the systemically elevated soluble PDL1, and see if that's sufficient to induce regression. 
If not, you can probably enhance the response by blocking the PD-1 receptor against membrane ligation, ligation by membrane PD-L1 from cancer cells. But first, disinhibit the tumor microenvironment. That's the first step. A recent forecast by, uh, by Nature Reviews uh, Drug Discovery estimated that, uh, that the best-selling drug in 2023 would be uh, Merck's uh, PD-1 inhibitor, uh, Keytruda, uh, and will generate uh, over $23 billion in sales worldwide. Um, where do you see nanotics in uh, the commercial landscape? Are uh, big pharma companies like Merck competitors or uh, potential partners? We don't actually view pharmaceutical companies or other startups as competitors at all. Um, first of all, the market is so huge mm -hmm. that it can support any innovative company yep. developing something useful. Um, but also, we're really all on the same team. We're on team human, and we're going after a huge threat against our our team. So there's plenty of money to go around. Um, we we want we wish success on anyone working in this space. We expect to be successful ourselves. Both we're we're past the point where we have doubts as to whether nanots are going to work, and anything that works in this space generates incredible revenue. So and the bar is actually quite low because cancer is just so challenging to treat. Metastatic disease is still usually fatal. So anything that shows any benefit, the, that's pretty much where the bar is. You know, Any benefit at all is where the bar is. And if you can achieve that, you're going to be enormously successful. So we wish all of the people in this space success. Um, and we will either succeed ourselves as a monotherapy or we will collaborate with anyone who has a technology that either we can enhance or that can enhance efficacy of nanots. Yeah, you, you're right, Lula. Um, good results in life sciences are uh, are a win for 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 everyone, really. So uh, it's uh, we we are facing this uh, problem uh, in common as uh, as the human species. I know that this is a very hard question to to estimate. But um, when do you expect to to begin uh, human cancer trials on, on the Mayo Clinic? That's a great question. Um, and it's not that hard to answer. It's capital okay. dependent. Um, oh. We're constantly raising money, you know, like the baby bird always needs another worm. Um, in If we get the capital we need uh, in our next fundraising push, we will be entering the clinic in first in human studies in about 18 months. 18 to 20 months. So we're, we're, we've solved all our engineering problems. Mm -hmm. We just have kind of routine, got to make these nanots under GMP, got to do talk studies, blah, blah, blah. But they work. They work and um, they work both in terms of engineering and in terms of clinical efficacy in preclinical models. So we're pretty much ready to progress to humans. Oh, so, sounds, uh, sounds good. So, so it's, uh, you're, you will dive into the whole field of personalized uh, cancer treatment uh you would uh the nanos would be targeted to to them the specific uh, actually that that's you raise a really good point which yeah. is personalized cancer treatment so when people say personalized cancer treatment they mean they can mean different things okay so there are autologous cell therapies like engineered cell therapies car t cells where it's based on your own cells. They've taken mm -hmm. your cells, immune cells out of the body and they've stimulated them or transgenically modified them in certain ways. Uh, that's personalized, but it's the logistics of that are hell. It's very, very challenging to, to do these personalized cell therapies. Nanots are personalized in that we measure the target that's elevated. We use a multiplex ELISA to figure out which immune inhibitors are elevated in a given patient. That guides the selection of the nanot. And also mm -hmm. because we can quantify these targets in, in your blood in advance of dosing, it also guides the measurement, also guides the dosing. That's different than drugs. There is no, you can't really quantify membrane targets. You can quantify mm -hmm. soluble targets with an ELISA. So um, this, this is what we mean by personalized. We measure the targets that are elevated. We choose nanots relevant to those targets and we dose them relevant to the concentration in your blood. 
but the tar but the, the therapy itself, the nanots themselves are pulled off the shelf. They're, they're not personalized. They're, they're designed for the, to deplete these targets that are common to multiple cancers and don't, aren't different. Soluble PDL1, soluble TNF receptors are exactly the same at a molecular level across all patients, all human mm -hmm. patients. So we don't need to personalize the therapy to deplete the target from a given patient's blood. Got it. So, so it's uh, it's uh, technically it's less challenging to to deploy. Yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, a lot easier. We're not personalizing the therapy. We're only personalizing the administration of it. So um, let's uh, shift gears and um, and focus on another major clinical application that that you mentioned um, uh, that I saw in your in your table at the beginning. Um, um, what circulating protein or, or proteins? Are nanots targeting in the in the context of sepsis, which which is a, a really serious condition with with a, with not many uh, treatment options. Um, so just as most families have been touched by cancer, uh, you know, one out of four people will develop cancer. Um, most families have been touched by sepsis as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I lost my stepfather, very dear, brilliant man, to sepsis. Um, and he, he had he had no under his underlying condition was just I think a kidney infection or something like that. I mean he was a ninety something, but he was a robust, healthy, smart, functional guy who got sepsis and died in stemming from an infection. And then that's typical. A lot of sepsis patients don't have a terminal underlying condition. It's it's the immune over response of sepsis that killed them. Mm -hmm. um, it kills more people than all forms of cancer combined. In many ways, it's simpler than cancer, and we think easier to treat. No one has ever treated it before successfully. There have been over 100 clinical trials in sepsis, all of which have failed or shown just very, very marginal results in a very limited patient set. Um, but it's, even though it's clinically complicated, like the ways you things you have to do to manage um, patient care in a, in a sepsis in the ICU with sepsis patients, it's very complicated, but that doesn't mean at a molecular level that sepsis is complicated. We know there's consensus among scientists as to what inflammatory cytokines drive the inflammatory phase of sepsis. And the problem is the drugs against these inflammatory molecules reduce immune competence. Well, most sepsis patients have an active pathogen. And if you reduce immune competence, the pathogen's just going to bloom. So the, the drug, the existing drugs for treat for, for neutralizing these inflammatory cytokines just make the just make it worse. And, and people don't actually know that TNF, which is the large TNF inhibitors, the largest drug class of all, were actually initially developed to treat sepsis. They failed at treating sepsis. So they repurposed them for arthritis. That's the main thing they're used oh. for. Um, but they were originally developed for sepsis, but they, don't, they didn't work for sepsis um, for reasons that nanots will work. So nanots deplete uh, these inflammatory cytokines very, very quickly. Um, within a few minutes, they're gone. Uh, and they don't affect immune cells. And that's critical. Patients need to maintain immune competence to work with the antibiotics to overcome the pathogen that's driving the storm, but they need for that elevated cytokine level to be rapidly depleted. And nanots can do that. And it's the first toolkit that can do that. Now there's also a, a, a second phase in sepsis, which now kills more people than the first phase. So clinical interventions have become sophisticated enough that many patients can be guided through the inflammatory phase. But the inflammatory phase triggers a, another phase called immune paralysis, where the body throws every endogenous immune inhibitor it has at the problem. And that puts the patient into a state of immune incompetence, which is kind of like AIDS, basically. Okay. Uh, and the patient can then die of the nosocomial, you know, the infections that are just floating around the hospital. And that's how, that's currently what kills most sepsis patients is this immune paralysis phase. 
first of all, patients aren't going to go into immune paralysis if you deplete the inflammatory cytokines sufficiently that it doesn't trigger immune paralysis. Secondly, we know the molecules that actually drive the immune paralysis phase, and we can target those too. It includes soluble TNF receptors. So the same molecule that cancer uses to inhibit incoming immune attack is also one of the key drivers of the immune paralysis phase in sepsis. And, and this is a perfect illustration of how cancer and sepsis are in some ways sister conditions. Cancer is a disease of immune inhibition and sepsis is a disease initially of a runaway immune reaction followed by immune inhibition. So we think of nanots as a toolkit of immune modulators and how and when you use which nanot you need to be thoughtful and you need to measure what's going on in the patient's body. It's quantitative. You measure which targets are elevated and you have some understanding of what these targets are doing, how they're driving the clinically observable conditions. And that tells you which nanot to administer to, to stop that process. Um, it's a new toolkit and um, we think it's gonna make a big difference both in sepsis and in the aging analog of sepsis, which is inflammaging. And actually, the only difference between sepsis and inflammaging is time scale. It's okay. the same molecules. The same molecules are active in inflammaging as are active in sepsis. The, the difference is time scale. These molecules rise very rapidly in sepsis over a period of about five days. In aging, they rise over a period of about five decades, but it's the same molecules. So kind of raises the question, is sepsis rapidly accelerated aging or is aging slow motion sepsis? Either way, the same toolkit should be useful for addressing either condition. And, um, and, and, and either way, we can, uh, it is fair to consider them um, conditions with this regulated uh, uh, cytokine profile in the blood. As, uh, exactly. You said. How do you envision this uh, therapy working out? Would we need to go to a clinic? Um, how do you see this uh, process developing? Right. So um, the Gen 2 nanots, the current generation of nanots circulate for about 16 hours. Um, mm -hmm. And Gen 1 was only about 90 minutes. And Gen 2 is totally ready to you know, go into humans and treat various diseases. But they are best for treating acute diseases where you want to do a rapid intervention and you don't need it to persist. Um, it's worth making a quick distinction between nanots and drugs. With drugs, you're, the drug is usually applying pharmacologic pressure on a specific membrane, protein, or receptor, mm -hmm. and you need to keep that pressure up. Nanots work differently. They actually take a target out. So even though the nanot circulation is only 16 hours, the target being gone could have a much longer impact than 16 hours, depending on how long it takes the body to regenerate that target, right? Now in mm -hmm. cancer, you have a tumor that's actively regenerating that target. And every time you deplete the inhibitory targets with nanots, you have a period of time where the tumor is defenseless, the immune system attacks it and does serious damage to it. The tumor though keeps cranking out these targets and will re-erect its shield and you need to do another dose of nanots to tear that away. With inflammatory cytokines, they're pleiotropic is the term. And what that means is they, they have multiple functions. Okay. So inflammatory cytokines are cytotoxic to non-immune cells, but they also activate and recruit immune cells. They will, uh, Auto-induce is the term. So inflammatory cytokines will auto-induce their own secretion. So when you use a nanot to take them out, you do two things. You One, you reduce the damage that they're causing to whatever cell they touch. And two, you break the cycle of auto-induction. Now you might not break that with a single dose. You might have to do a few doses because you're dealing with dysregulated cells. You can, you can you could take out all the excess systemic inflammatory cytokines and you still have dysregulated immune cells. They're gonna think it's their job to release these things systemically. 
But over time, as you keep removing the stimulus that these immune cells are receiving, eventually, we believe, and there's some data to support this, they will return to a normal immune state where they only deliver these cytokines focally against aberrant cells rather than systemically. Um, and this would be, yeah, uh, it, and this would would it mean that that you solve the inflammation by uh, potentially toning down the immune yeah, system? Potentially, but you might have to do several doses. Now mm -hmm. we do have a Gen three nano that we're working on that will have a much longer circulation time. Oh. We don't need this for cancer, but, and we don't even need it for sepsis, but um, for longevity treatments, okay. the kind of thing where you might want a nanop that circulates for a week or two, that's going to be a helpful platform. It's a ways away, but it's a helpful platform. And we're specifically doing it for um, chronic conditions like arthritis, where you would really rather just have it one injection, one or two injections a month. But it's also that's the platform that I think will be most useful for aging. Okay, um, but uh, to summarize, the, the first uh, clinical trial would be for cancer, then uh, for sepsis, and um, eventually maybe for inflammatory conditions and um, and aging. Is that is this correct? Yes. So depending so the way on the are, are yes, capital contingent are. Our lead indications, which are 18 to 20 months away from clinic, are um, for oncology. Mm -hmm. We also have nanots against the major inflammatory cytokines. And their trials, you have to do uh, individual trials of those nanots in relevant diseases, like, well, the relevant inflammatory diseases like arthritis, psoriasis, and um, conditions like that. And then you combine them into uh, say three of them together, nanots against um, TNF alpha, IL-1 beta and IL-6, we believe is the cocktail that will be most useful for most sepsis patients. That's a separate trial. So you have mm -hmm. to actually do a safety study of all three of those nanots. Then you do a, another trial of the combination. So that cap, it's capital dependent, but I think that could be within two or three years, be um, ready to do its first in human study in sepsis. Let's say three years. It's, um, um, it seems that you're moving along and, uh, and that um, and hopefully these trials will um, come in uh, sooner uh, than, than what you plan. Um, maybe um, to conclude the interview, um, would you um, be able to, to give some advice to other um, entrepreneurs uh, trying to solve um, uh, problems in the space of of aging and uh, age related diseases, what is, what what advice would you give to your to your younger self? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think I think you need to believe in yourself, believe that you can do it. The, the frontier of science and medicine is actually not that far out. It seems like it's, you know, an eternity away, mm -hmm. like light years away, because so much research has been done. But the edge is actually not that far out. So you, you need to believe you can do it. But then you also have to really do your homework to make sure you understand the molecular mechanisms. Don't fall in the, into the trap of believing that AI can solve these problems for you. Um, I, don't, I don't personally believe that's the case. I think AI is a useful tool, but you really have to understand it yourself. And there's no shortcut to spending years reading the literature. You have to love, I would say the best piece of advice I can get is love the literature, fall in love with the literature. And, and really get to know it. Get to know it inside out in your chosen field, your chosen subfield. And then connect is... with like-minded lovers of literature, of the literature, the scientific literature. That, that, that sounds great. That's, that's, uh, that's great advice, Lou. And um, th thank you very much for, for uh, sharing your time with me. And... Um, I wish you really the best in uh, in all these uh, 
and the birds. Uh, thank, thank you, you for your time. so much. It was a fascinating interview, and I wish you and Quadroscope, which is just a great entity with a great mission, I wish you the best of luck as well. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too. Goodbye.